The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. Um, thank you for joining us from wherever you are. Uh, this is Emily Steele and I'm um, sitting here in Melbourne in Australia and we also have Anna Nolstor on the line with us. Hello. Um, Hi. Today we're going to be, well, it's a joint webinar with Cochrane Crowd and Cochrane Task Exchange and we're going to hopefully answer your question, how can I start working on Cochrane systematic reviews? So as I said, I'm Emily Steele. Some of you um, may have had some email contact with me over the last few years. I'm, I sit with both platforms as the Community Engagement and Partnerships man Manager for Crowd and Task Exchange. And of course, Anna, you'll I'm sure know very well, is the manager of Cochrane Crowd. A little bit of housekeeping before we get going fully. Um, so just to give a sense of what we're going to cover today, we've set aside an hour for the webinar. We may or may not need that whole hour. Um, first of all, Anna's going to take us um, through well, there's, there's two pathways for working with Cochrane Systematic Review. So Anna's going to take us through one and I'll take you through the other one. And then we'll set aside quite a bit of time at the end for Q&A. Um, if you do have questions while we're talking, we invite you to go to the questions tab in the GoToWebinar control panel and write your question into, into that space. And when we um, get up to the Q&A um, section, we will read your questions out loud and, and hopefully respond to them then. Okay, so let's get moving. So this webinar came about because as you will all know, earlier this year, we did a Cochrane Crowd user research study. And part of that study was a survey. And in the survey, 70% of you said that you'd like to work on individual systematic reviews. So that was a huge number and it was so great to hear that because we've been able to go away, um, have a look at how that might happen and come back to you with two very clear pathways. So the first pathway, um, which Anna will talk to in a moment, is called Screen For Me and it's a particular task type under the Cochrane Crowd um, platform. And the second pathway is Cochrane Task Exchange, which some of you may not have heard of before. Um, this is really the sister platform to Cochrane Crowd um, and is a different way to um, starting to work on Cochrane Systematic Review. So today what we're hoping to do is tell you about both of these pathways and invite you into, into both of them. So I'm now going to hand over to Anna to talk to you first about Screen For Me. So just changing presenter. Thanks, Emily. And over to okay, you. Okay, thank you. So show my screen. I'm hoping that you can, I'll just get to the start slide and then Emily, if you can just confirm, you can see it. Let's get into presentation mode. Yep. That looks okay, great, can Anna. you see my screen okay? Fantastic. Yes. Okay, so thanks very much. So Cochrane Crowd, um, as you all know, I'm sure, is Cochrane's crowdsourcing platform, <clears throat> and it offers what we call micro tasks. So these are small, discrete tasks that focus on identifying and describing health research. And we have a range of ongoing micro tasks. And these are tasks that are always present on Cochrane Crowd. And so we've got sort of three examples of tasks. Oops, has it come out of presentation mode? Let me just pop that back in. There we go. Kind of three examples of micro tasks. Um, as I'm sure you are probably all very familiar with, we've got the RCTID task, which is about identifying <clears throat> randomized trials from bibliographic databases. We've got the CTID task, which is about identifying randomized trials from clinicaltrials.gov. And we've got the ICTRP task, which is about identifying trial registry records from the um, World Health Organization Meta Portal. And so the crowd, you know, being you lovely people, help to identify RCTs for each of these tasks. Um, 
And these ongoing micro tasks help to do two, two important things. So they help to feed Central, which is Cochrane's central repository of controlled trials. And they um, help to feed the machine as well. So, and by that, I mean, they help to um, develop machine learning classifiers. And so these classifiers then bring increased efficiency to the process of identifying RCTs. And we now use um, what we call an RCT machine learning classifier to help identify the records that are very unlikely to be describing a randomized trial so that we don't then waste human effort on rejecting these very obvious reject records. I knew that little animation was going to pop in then, sorry. Because ultimately with these mainstream tasks, we're trying to identify as many of the randomized trials as possible so that researchers and clinicians and patients around the world can find the relevant health evidence more easily and quickly. And so far, this amazing community, which now stands at around 13,000 people from around the world, has assessed over 650,000 records across those three micro tasks, generating a whopping 1.3 million individual classifications across our five mainstream micro tasks. So really just an opportunity for me to say a huge thank you to everybody who's helped us reach that kind of milestone. But today I want to focus on a new type of task, as Emily has just mentioned, which we call Screen for Me, S for M for short. And these tasks are linked to specific Cochrane reviews. And we went live with Screen for Me tasks in April this year, so it's all pretty new. We had it. Um, we did a lot of pilot testing last year, but we actually went sort of officially live in April this year. And so far they have proved very popular. So just a bit of background then. One of the most critical tasks for any Cochrane review, indeed any systematic review, is the identification of all potentially relevant studies. Not identifying relevant studies can mean that the results of the review are skewed, and you know, even potentially inaccurate. So it really is a critical step to try and identify all potentially relevant evidence. And so as we continue to populate Cochrane's central registry of controlled trials with RCTs, as I've just described a few slides ago, you know, making that resource ever more comprehensive. You know, in the meantime, we want to develop a new type of task on Cochrane Crowd that would help author teams in the here and now, in the present day, to, to find the RCTs for their reviews. And so in order to find all the relevant studies, review author teams, usually working very closely with a Cochrane information specialist, have to run what we call very sensitive searches. And these are very sort of inclusive searches across a wide range of sources. And that usually results, this, this sort of necessity for sensitivity and inclusiveness results in there being um, often a high number of, of hits, a high number of search results to screen, many of which won't be at all relevant to the review. So you get a lot of, um, a lot of noise in the search results. And this is where Screen for Me comes in. And so potentially it's a work, essentially it's a workflow that Cochrane information specialists and authors can access to help them screen search results for their Cochrane reviews. And it has three main components to it. The first is what we call the known assessment stage. And this is where the search results go through the already existing data that we have. So in other words, if a record in the search results matches a record that's already been through Cochrane Crowd and has been determined to be describing an RCT or determined to be not describing an RCT, we don't send it through again. We just match it up with that bit of metadata that we've already collected. And so this first stage is all about us trying to make better use of already known information. 
The second stage is the machine learning stage. And so this is where the remaining search results go through the RCT machine learning classifier that we've managed to develop. And the classifier gives each record a probability score of how likely the record is to be describing a randomized trial. And records that get a very low score are then removed from the set, as we're now very confident that the machine will have got, got it right for over 99% of the time. And then the final stage of the Screen for Me workflow is where you come in. And this is where the, the remaining search results, so the search results that haven't been knocked out by the known assessment stage or by the RCT classifier stage, are sent to Cochrane Crowd. And the task is the same one that we all have come to know and love. It's helping to find the RCTs in that set of search results. So the Screen for Me tasks are easily identifiable as they appear on Cochrane Crowd because they all have the Screen for Me purple icon. And here's a screenshot of a Screen for Me task on Cochrane Crowd, live on Cochrane Crowd at the moment, in fact. And you can see it's got the little purple icon in the top right hand corner. In order to be able to take part in Screen for Me crowd tasks, you have to have completed 100 assessments in the RCT identification task. That'll then um, sort of unlock or open you up to being able to see any Screen for Me tasks that are on Cochrane Crowd. And if you want to take part then in a Screen for Me task, you then have to complete a very brief training module in the Screen for Me task. And it is very brief. It is only eight records. It just acts as a, as a quick refresher of what the RCT identification task is all about. It's just to remind you because it might have been a while since you've done the RCT identification task. So what do you then get out of taking part in a Screen for Me task? Well, first, of course, I hope there's that warm, fuzzy feeling you get from um, contributing to these important tasks on Cochrane Crowd. It's also a great way to see some of the latest research that's happening in a particular area. So with the Screen for Me tasks, for example, the one that I just showed was about um, kind of cognitive interventions to help uh, prevent cognitive decline. So if it's an area that you're interested in, chances are a lot of the search results that you'll screen will be about that topic. They won't all be about that topic because, of course, as I've said, the searches that we have to run are incredibly sensitive, but you'll get, you know, a very high proportion of records that are on topic. And so if that's something you're interested in, then it's a good way to, to see what's happening in that area. But probably one of the, the main rewards is that if you complete 250 or more assessments on a Screen for Me task, you'll get named acknowledgement in that Cochrane review when it is published. And you can also use the classifications that you build up on Screen for Me tasks um, as the sort of classification count that goes towards earning Cochrane membership. So you need a thousand classifications and if you want to just get a thousand classifications all in one task, you can do that. But if you wanted to, you know, take part in some of these Screen for Me tasks, then those classifications that you make, those assessments that you make in those tasks will also count towards earning you Cochrane membership. And so I'm just going to conclude there really that in summary, I think Screen for Me crowd tasks are a, a great first step towards contributing to specific Cochrane reviews. And so, Emily, that's mm -hmm. that's my bit done. So I will come out of that mode now and see if I can hand back the screen to you. Mm -hmm.
OK, hopefully you'll be being asked. Wonderful. Um, can you see my screen now? I can. That looks great. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you, Anna. Um, I've been keeping an eye on the questions box as Anna's been talking. So thank you for the questions that are already there. Um, and please, of course, feel free to keep keep uh, writing, typing them in as I talk as well. And thank you for all the hellos <laughs> as we first got on. It's nice to it's nice to have uh, have that pop in as well. So this screen that you're now looking at is the homepage of Cochrane Task Exchange, um, and you can see there. The, the big banner says, a bigger team than you think. Connect with the global health evidence community to get your work done more quickly. What I would really like to know before I kind of launch in is a bit about you and your connection to Task Exchange. So I'm going to launch a poll if I can manage this technology. The first one is asking if you're a member of um, Task Exchange. So I'd love it if you could click your answer in now. And I'm just watching those answers come in. Thank you very much. I'll close the poll there and share the results. So let's see, about half of you are not a member of Task Exchange. And I'm always curious about this this 21% that don't know <laughs> fascinates me. So maybe you'll be twigged to remember as I keep talking. Um, I'm going to close that one and launch the second and final poll. Um, so for those who said they are members, have you ever responded to a task on Task Exchange? So you should be able to answer that now. And I will close the poll and share those results. So about 50% haven't responded to a task. Okay, so that's, that's really just great to know where you're all up to with Task Exchange. And so let's just start with the basics of what, what are we. So as I said before, we're, we consider ourselves a sister platform to Cochrane Crowd. So Crowd and Task Exchange both being Cochrane platforms that invite people to get involved um, in slightly different ways. So Task Exchange is an online platform that brings people together to get health evidence projects done more quickly. So there are two general types of people that come onto Task Exchange. The first type um, are people needing help. So it's a place to go for people needing help with health evidence projects. Could be systematic reviews. Task Exchange is also open to, to anyone else working in health evidence to join. So sometimes we get guideline projects and other types of health evidence synthesis projects. Um, but I'm sure all of you are here on this webinar um, being in the second category of people that are wanting to help out. So Task Exchange offers opportunities for meaningful contributions for all sorts of people, health consumers, students, really anyone wanting to gain skills in health evidence, including what we call health evidence new newcomers. So people who are who might be students or just learning about health evidence and, and wanting to, to get more skills in the area. So t crowd members are ideal for task exchange because you already have some grounding in, um, in health evidence by virtue of the tasks you've been involved with on, on crowd. So why would you want to join Task Exchange? So mostly people wanting, are wanting to join. If, if you're interested in, in helping out, you're wanting to build skills and gain experience in health evidence. Um, for each task that you are involved in, you'll either be one of three things. You'll be acknowledged in um, the final output of the project, which is often a Cochrane systematic review. You might be offered payment. Occasionally, people are paid um, to do this sort of helper work. Um, and depending on the on the input and on um, how much help you provide, occasionally people are offered authorship um, on the output, um, i.e. The, the systematic review. So you'll certainly receive one or more of those three things for every task that you help out on. 
Um, also on Task Exchange, you can accumulate recommendations on your Task Exchange profile. And uh, people often find that those recommendations are good for CVs, for example, if you're a student and looking to um, eventually get a job, which, um, which is ideal for most of us. Uh, you can use those recommendations for CVs and um, applying for jobs and so on. And you can also work towards Cochrane membership on Task Exchange in, in a similar way to Crowd. Uh, for Task Exchange, it's about how many tasks you're contributing to and what sort of tasks they are. So I wanted you to know that a thousand people have worked on systematic reviews through Task Exchange. So, and this is a growing number of people, as you can see. Um, the community now has almost 4,000, well, just over three and a half thousand, I don't want to exaggerate, <laughs> users, so, but we're a growing community and this year um, we have a, a goal of reaching 6,000. So we, um, we have perhaps lofty goals, <laughs> but we're planning to keep expanding rapidly this year. Some people wonder if they've got the skills to help out on task exchange, and I would say, I'm sure you do. 30% um, of our tasks I would say don't involve highly specialised skills. So consumer input tasks make up 10% of the tasks. So this is where you would be commenting on either a protocol or a finished report from a consumer's point of view. 10% um, are data extraction tasks, which um, do require some training, but task posters are uh, often happy to do that um, on task exchange with task exchange responders and the same goes for screening tasks so again some training required but um, usually considered appropriate for someone who's a um, who's fairly new to to health evidence work so uh, if that's you I'd encourage you um, to not not be afraid to get on even if you're fairly new to the world of health evidence because there are certainly tasks for newcomers and in fact those sorts of tasks are marked on task exchange with a green leaf. So um, that's something to look out for if you're in that category of newcomer to health evidence. So this shows how task exchange works for helpers. So from the top left, um, if you're jumping on for the first time, you'll need to log in to task exchange. You log in using your Cochrane account information and we know that you have a Cochrane account because you're um, a member of Crowd. The first time you log in we invite you to create a profile um, and that is there's a template there that's very easy to follow you can choose to put a photo up or not and then just filling out the template with details of your skills and any study that you've done um, any experience that you have so far in the world of health evidence. The profiles really help because if someone posts a task saying they want help for screening and they get 10 responses, they tend to go fairly quickly to the profile and have a read of who you are there. So I think that's an important thing to do. Once you've created a profile, you can then browse the list of tasks. So at any one time, there might be anywhere between 20 and 60 tasks available and public, publicly viewable. Um, you can, you know, yep, so you'd go through the list, have a look at what interests you. You can also, um, going down to the next uh, icon there, receive notifications when tasks are posted that are relevant for you. So you don't, I think that's a great thing to do because then you don't need to remember to go back to the platform all the time. You actually receive notifications in your email inbox. Um, once you see a task that looks interesting, you would take a look at what reward is offered see when the task needs to be completed by and, um, you know, looking at your diary and figuring out whether you're going to be able to do it in that time frame. You can then connect up with the task poster and let them know that you're interested. They'll get back to you and if you're, um, if they choose you as the helper, you'll get on with the work and obviously complete the task and everyone will be thrilled, <laughs> both the task poster and hopefully you with your new um, experience and skills. So these are my top tips for helpers, people wanting to help out. The first one is just making sure you sell your strengths and that's mostly to do with setting up your profile well. So I think when people log into a new website like this, I mean, 
me included, we can be lazy. We can either not set up the profile or just set it up in with really um, sparse information, but it really does help to fill it out properly because, as, as I said, the task um, posters go there straight away to see who you are. So it's really worth spending a bit of time doing that well. Um, I really recommend signing up for the weekly task alerts. You might want to grab a pen. Um, I'm just going to tell you how to do that because right now, in fact, it's not super clear on the platform and that's something that we're about to update, but at the moment it's a little hidden. So if you want to sign up for the task alerts, you would go to um, manage profile um, and then and that's in the, a drop-down menu, which is in the top banner on the home page of Task Exchange. Manage profile, you then scroll down to the bottom of that screen and there you're able to type in your skills and the health topics that you're interested in. And once you save that information, if um, every Monday, if there's anything on Task Exchange that matches your skills and or the topics, you'll get an email. If there's nothing there that matches your interests, you won't get an email. So it's it's pretty straightforward. But I think that's a great way to go if you're looking at helping out rather than, as I said, continuing, like having to remind yourself, putting in a reminder in your phone to go and check the website and these sorts of things. Um, when you do jump if jump on the website, you will see that the, the long list of, of tasks there, you can filter the tasks um, by skills. So if you're specifically wanting to get some skills in data extraction or in screening as examples, you can filter the task list by those sorts of things and, and um, that'll help you if there's 60 tasks there, you don't need to scroll through all of them. The next thing I've got there is sending winning messages. Um, and this one's, it's really important. So the, the thing here is that when you come across a task that you're interested in, the first thing that you need to do is is message the task poster. And I sometimes get sent some of these messages as well from task posters who are having trouble deciding who to choose or um, in other situations. And I do actually often see messages that I guess have been written in a hurry. You know, maybe you're responding to 10 tasks at, at once and, and sending quick messages. I would I would take some time to send those messages because yes, if if, you, if the task post is getting ten and then they need to, they they'll look at the profile, but they're also going to look at that message obviously to weed out um, people that might not be appropriate and to figure out who's going to do the best job. So just yeah, taking some time with those messages is um, is important. I think um, I think the next thing's probably self-explanatory, just being reliable, being accurate, being polite. Um, and then the final thing there, getting recommended for future tasks. So this one, this is how this works. Once you've, if you've been chosen for a task, you go away and do the task. You send the work back to the task poster. You as the um, helper logs back into Task Exchange and, and clicks um, a button that says, says something like task finished or work completed. And when you click that, um, the task poster gets an, an auto email that says, would you like to recommend this person for future tasks? And they can then click yes and, and write um, a recommendation that gets attached to your profile. And so that way, when you apply for your next task, that task poster will go to your profile and, and see that you've been recommended and that you've done a good job for other people. So I think that's also important if you're interested in um, getting involved in reviews through Task Exchange. The hyperlink that I've put on the bottom of the screen is a blog that I think is also really useful to read um, and it's about how to successfully help out. So it expands on some of what I've said just now and gives a few more bits and pieces of information as well. Once we finish this webinar, you'll be sent this recording. Um, so you'll, be, you'll have a copy of that, that blog link to follow up on. So that's really all I wanted to say. Um, so just to finish up with, uh, there's the web address for Task Exchange, so you can um, hop on on there shortly and, and take a look around, complete your profile, signing up to task alerts, as I explained before, having a look at tasks and responding to those that interest you. Um, you can feel free to email me at any time on taskexchange at cochrane.org with um, any questions or feedback. 
we're going to be doing an update of the platform in the next few months. So we're um, particularly interested in any feedback that you have, any ideas that you have for making the platform even better. And at the bottom of the screen there, I've put our Twitter account. We, we are quite active on Twitter at the moment. We um, tweet out the um, new tasks as they come up and other information that's relevant to, to task responders and task posters on Task Exchange. So that brings me to the end of that. Um, and I think uh, we have now got a fair bit of time for questions, if you have any. Both Anna and I are really happy to take questions. What I might do, um, Anna, if that sounds okay, there are, I can see a few questions in the question box now, so I'll read them out. Does that sound okay, Anna? Yes. Yep, sounds like a good idea. Great. So the first question I can see here is, how many points does each ta task have? Um, so thank you for that question. And I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. I'm so sorry, but that's come from Gazal. Um, so I'm assuming that question, oh, I guess it could be relevant for both platforms. I'll just answer on behalf of so, Task Exchange. Yeah, go for it. Yep. Yeah. So with Task Exchange, and I'm imagining this, for Task Exchange, it relates to Cochrane membership. Um, so in fact, the connection between Task Exchange and Cochrane membership isn't um, in place at the moment, and the, the system for um, attaching points to tasks is still being sorted out. What I can tell you is that once the system is in place, the, all the tasks that have already been done will, so points will be um, allocated retrospectively to, for, for anything that you've already done. So, um, but as for exactly how many points, um, we will be letting everyone know as soon as we can. So over to you, Anna. Yeah, so in Cochrane Crowd, um, it it's um, we've got it so that it's a thousand. You need to do a thousand assessments, so have screened and classified a thousand records in order to qualify for Cochrane membership. And we've made it so that that thousand uh, sort of points total can be accumulated across. The different tasks so if you did 250 in rctid and 250 in ctid and then 500 in across some screen for me tasks all together it would add up to a thousand and then you'd be offered cochrane membership we also use that kind of thousand benchmark in cochrane crowd um, as part of our milestone badge system so we brought that out about a year and a half ago now i suppose and so at certain points um within you know your progression through certain tasks you can earn badges so you get your green badge for completing the training of a task and then your your bronze silver and gold badges for completing a certain number of um, classifications or assessments on records and gold is also um, equates to having done a thousand in Cochrane Crowd, a thousand in one particular task. The milestone badge system is connected just to each each task. You can also then progress to a purple badge, which is where an additional calculation is done to work out your accuracy in that particular task. And so a purple badge means you know you've got extremely high accuracy in that particular task. And at that point, you can be asked if you want to become an expert in that task. And if you become an expert, in that particular Cochrane Crowd task, your decisions can carry more weight in the system. So everybody starts off in Cochrane Crowd at the same level, and then as you progress within tasks and across tasks, you can accumulate these points that earn you membership, but also points that earn you a kind of uh, extra weighting in the system. Fantastic, thanks Anna. Um, I have another question here from Gazal, and Anna, I might um, ask you to respond to this one before I do. This one says, yeah. hello, thank you for the webinar. My question is how many tasks one needs to do in Cochrane Crowd and Task Exchange to be able to move from being a contributor to being an author? Mm, mm, mm. And I know that's something that, you know, probably a, a, a lot of number of people on this webinar kind of want, want a sort of firm answer and there isn't, there isn't one, I'm afraid. I mean, in Cochrane Crowd, 
the tasks, as I described in the early slides, are generally about helping to maintain a central repository of trials. They're about helping to generate data sets that help to train machine learning classifiers. And now, as, as we've described today, we also have tasks that do enable people to contribute to specific Cochrane reviews but currently in Cochrane Crowd only as far as helping to screen the search results, which under the, you know, the international guidelines for earning authorship is not generally deemed enough to earn authorship. So we offer the appropriate reward for that kind of task, which is named acknowledgement in a Cochrane review. But I do completely understand that people want to progress beyond that and I think that's where task exchange comes in and offers some of those opportunities to mm. to do, to perhaps progress and do that and build up that kind of track record of experience that you need in order to become an author. Mm. Thanks Anna. Um, for task exchange I would say again it's not super clear-cut in that we can't say if you do x many tasks of x type you know mm. you're ready to be an author um, you will see on task exchange that occasionally authorship is offered um, in response to a task, but I would say that's generally for people who already have, you know, a fair amount of experience and what's a fair amount of experience again? <laughs> like I, I don't have a clear answer for mm. that, but certainly um, you will be acknowledged at, at the very least if you are helping out on task exchange on a systematic review, you'll gain acknowledgement in that review. Um, I think something that might be useful for you to read, um, we're developing a blog series for Task Exchange and one of the, the second blog that's in queue to be published um, in the next few weeks is from a PhD student who's been responding to Task Exchange tasks over the last couple of years and is working towards, um, you know, her aim is to be a Cochrane author. And so she's developing expertise and content knowledge in a particular area through her PhD and she's gaining skills through task exchange by helping out on other people's reviews. And so she, the blog sort of steps out a pathway that she's undertaking to becoming an author eventually. So I think that might be something that's quite useful for you to read. Um, and I did have one other thing that I wanted to say, but it has escaped me, of course. So perhaps I'll come back to it in a moment. And if I don't, I will um, no doubt think of it once we hang up and I can respond to you directly, Gazal. So thank, thank you for all your questions. Um, I see the, here that you do you have one more question and you say, I have done some consumer review on some systematic review protocols. I was wondering what I need to do to become an author. I'm doing the interactive e-learning modules too. What else do I need to do? So, yeah, I feel like we've probably responded to that already. Um, but I think it's great that you're also yeah. looking at the e-learning modules as well. Mm. Did you want to add, add anything? Definitely. There? No, just that I really do recommend them. And um, and I think that's, that's the right approach to take is to build up both experience doing stuff, doing tasks, you know, mm. actually sort of contributing, but also that, you know, learning as well in the more sort of traditional way. I have another question here which says, hello Emily, do you still send us an email with all the tasks or only with our interest? Um, so thanks for that question. The procedure that I mentioned before where you go to um, manage profile on the t on once you've logged into Task Exchange, manage preferences, sorry, not manage profile, manage preferences, and then you type in your skills and the health um, areas that you're interested in. So that will give you a weekly email only relevant to the interest areas that you specify there. So that's how we that's how we offer. I mean, if you want to get a weekly email with everything, all the tasks included in it, you just wouldn't specify um, you you wouldn't specify specific health or skill areas. You would just leave those areas blank on the template and that way you would get all the tasks emailed to you every week. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, I've got another great question here from Ahmed. How can I follow on my previous acknowledgement in Cochrane Crowd if I want to put it in my CV? 
So how can I follow on my previous acknowledgement in Cochrane Crowd if I want to put it in my CV? Over to you. So Emma. I think is that is that essentially asking you know how how you can sort of um, reflect the fact that you have um, you know named acknowledgement uh, on a Cochrane review on your CV and I think that the easiest way is really to link to the appropriate Cochrane review um, in which you've been acknowledged and if it's if it's not yet published because this is something that you know it is worth making making clear that you know Cochrane reviews. As, as other robust systematic reviews also take quite a long time to produce. And so you might well have named acknowledgement coming your way, but the review might still be a few months off being published. Um, we can certainly very easily supply you with the details of the review that you will be named in. Um, also, if you take part in Screen for Me tasks, you'll be given a certificate of participation as well that you can include in your sort of uh, professional development folders. Um, but I think the, the main way to do it is to, you know, actually write the title of the review in which you're going to be named um, or link to it if it's already published. Great. Thanks, Anna. Um, I have a question here from Marlon. When I participate in a task, what is the usual duration or timeline given to me to finish it? Um, so I think that's probably relevant to both platforms. So if I answer first mm. for task exchange, the duration and timelines vary enormously, I would say. Um, and it was interesting, the blog I mentioned before that will be published soon um, where I spoke to a PhD student who's an avid responder, is super keen. Um, she checks the task list every Monday and usually responds to two or three tasks a week. And she, how she, she, so she, in her words, she, she says, there's so much variation in the duration and the size of tasks available that she's able to just look at her calendar and figure out how much, you know, what she's got time for in the next month and then uh, figure out which task she's going to apply for. I mean, I would say some of them are half an hour worth of work and some of them might be five days worth of work. Um, and in terms of sort of due date, some of them get put up with an urgent due date of that week. And some of them, I mean, some of them are for Cochrane authors. And as we know, the reviews can take a number of years. So um, there's huge variation in all of that. Um, yeah, and over to you, Anna, around the duration of yeah. Screen For Me tasks. Yeah. So we've set Screen For Me tasks at a kind of default of two weeks duration. So people would have two weeks in order to build up their 250 classifications for a Screen For Me task. But just sort of as, as with Emily was saying, there is some variation around that. So for example, we put out one, um, the first one that we went live with, in fact, was completed within a few days and so we didn't need the full two weeks and I think some people sort of were then disappointed because they weren't able to then jump on by the time they did log into Cochrane Crowd to take part the task was already completed. It's always going to be quite difficult for us to know exactly how long a task is going to take. I mean we've got we've got one that's live at the moment that actually needed an extension because it was quite a large number of search results and so we're quite flexible about extending the time but I do think if you're keen to um, you know get your named acknowledgement across a, a number of reviews through screen for me tasks then it's it's best to sort of check in as often as you can to see what's live you know there and then and see how it's progressing because you'll be able to kind of tell if some are you know, very near completion, then it might be something you want to focus on that day or over the next couple of days. But if it's something that we're, you know, chipping away at reasonably steadily or slowly, then you've probably got time to um, time to just do a few each day to build up your 250. But the default is two weeks, yeah, to mm -hmm. do the task. Thanks, Anna. Um, we have no end of questions, so I'll keep um, moving through them. This next one is from Agnia, and again, apologies for my pronunciation. This one's for you, Anna. She, she or he says, I missed a couple of slides in the beginning. What kind of 1,000 tasks do we need to accomplish to be eligible for the crowd? So I think that, um, so, yeah, I feel like there's maybe two questions there, one around um, is there any eligibility to join Crowd? And then 
um, the yeah. thousand task might be around Cochrane membership, perhaps. Over to you. Well, I think so. So mm. yeah, I um, so so you don't need any anything at all to join Cochrane Crowd, but if you want to take part in the screen for me tasks, and I wonder if that's that might be what the the question is. There's a threshold there, so you need to have completed a thousand assessments or classifications in the randomised control trial identification task, the main RCT ID task. Um, and that's because we do want people to have had at least some experience of 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 this task. Um, and so if you've done a hundred, then that'll unlock any sort of live screen for me tasks that are around. And then just in case it's also around a question around membership threshold, you need a thousand classifications or assessments which can be built up across any of the Cochrane Crowd tasks, including the Screen for Me tasks, to earn you Cochrane membership. Great. You've caught me flicking down through all the questions. <laughs> I'll just flick back up to where yeah, we were up to. Yeah, it's a long list, isn't it? <laughs> You're doing a great I'm job there. But if we don't get to answer all, we can certainly do it afterwards. But I think just keep going and uh, yes. yeah. That sounds great. It's yes, thank well. you so much for all the questions. It's uh, it's so much nicer giving a webinar when there's all these questions to answer. Mm, I feel absolutely. like there are people listening. <laughs> so the next one is from <laughs> Cecily, who says, is there a place in the dashboard to show points and or number of classifications that I've done? I'll leave yes, so I'm sure that's, yeah. that sounds like it's aimed at Cochrane Crowd. Yes, yeah, so in your dashboard, we made a tweak to the Cochrane Crowd task dashboard fairly recently that enables people to see all the previous tasks that they have taken part in. And that on those tasks, it should show the number of classifications that you've done. One thing I think Emily mentioned it earlier is we're going to be making a number of improvements to Cochrane Crowd this year and one of the ones that I'm very keen to see happen is to enable people to be able to see more easily across all the tasks you know what they have contributed to and how much they have done you can the dashboard works okay for that it as I say we have brought in this new feature that if you scroll down underneath a certain line in the dashboard, you see your previous task and it should have your classification totals for each of those there. But it's not ideal. Um, it's not sort of one neat, simple sort of report, if you like, that can give you all those details in one nice place that you might even want to be able to print off and add to your, you know, your folders and your CVs and things like that. So I'm hoping we'll um, improve that. It might not actually happen on Cochrane Crowd itself, it might be through the um, My Account system that Cochrane has now. So if you've, you know, since we moved to the single sign-on where your one account gives you access to all the Cochrane systems you need to access, I know that we are working with the team there to develop the profile there so that all this information about whether you do stuff on Cochrane Crowd or whether you do stuff on Task Exchange or whether you do stuff on the interactive learning modules can all be seen for you, you know, in one place rather than across all these different systems. So my, so I think that's my preference is that it's all in one place, but I would also like to see the Cochrane Crowd dashboard kind of present this information just a little bit more clearly. Mm. Great, thank you. Our next question is from Cecilia and she says, is there a time duration to obtain the 1000 classifications to get Cochrane membership, i.e. does it have to be done in a certain yes. Of time? Yes, yeah. yes, I think it does. I think you've got mm. a year. Mm. So they give you 12 months um, to earn your sort of thousand across the tasks. So that, should, that should really should be should be really doable. I think that's mm. a really realistic. Um, duration yeah yes time frame um okay yeah this is a great question I've got one another one about Cochrane membership from Marlon if we become a Cochrane member based on accumulated tasks how long will the membership be active from the time we get it and what are the advantages of obtaining a Cochrane membership good questions they are good questions um there is a there is a time limit, isn't there, on Cochrane membership? And I have to say, I think it's 
six months, Emily. You're going to have yeah, to correct I'm me if I'm as wrong. Well. I was going to have because they're, it's really new. Um, I'll just see if I can hop on. Hmm. Nine, perhaps if you just um, we could move to another question because we've yeah. got a few, and then I'll yeah. just see if I can find that out. Sure thing. It's a very good question. Um, um, I have another question here from Azim, who says, after completion of a screen for me task, when will we get the certificate of participation? Yeah, well, so I'm um, perhaps sensing you've contributed to a screen for me task and you haven't yet received your certificate of participation. Mm -hmm. So we, we are a bit delayed on the first one that is com has completed only because we're setting up um, a proper mail merge system to do it. But you should hopefully, well, and we should have that set up, well, hopefully today, um, they would be fairly imminent, but probably just to be realistic, they will probably be after the end of the task deadline. So let's say you've been super active and gone on and done your 250 very quickly, um, but the task is still live for another you know, week and a half. I think realistically it will be after the task has closed. It's just easier from an admin point of view for us to, to generate them all in one go once the task is closed. So hopefully it would be fairly quickly after the task deadline has closed but I do apologize if you're waiting on a certificate of participation for one that you have joined we had to we've had to do it manually um, in the first few instances and we've had so, so many people take part in the first couple that it's just been a bit of a tedious process but um, yeah now we have our our mail merge just about ready wonderful I think that we might be at the end of our questions, so I might just we'll sort of hover, hover for a moment in case you have any last questions that you'd like to ask. Anna, have you had any luck finding that information? Yeah, yeah, just on the page. Um, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it might be something we'll just have to feed back afterwards because yeah. I'm not. Uh, you know, I'll just have one quick look in this place here. Yeah, I'm not seeing that information just immediately. Obviously, no problem. Um, but we can easily so, email yeah. everyone um, in the next day or two with that information. I've just I've got one comment that's popped up that says someone couldn't log on to their account. So the thing to do there oh. would be to email. Cochrane support people and let them know and they'll help you sort that out. So that email and address. That's um, support at Cochrane.org. Great. Okay. One last check. If anyone's put any questions up and I can't see any new ones there. So I think we'll we'll wind up and I'm going to pop up on the screen those those details about task exchange. Um, for you to have a final look at. Anna, is there anything else that you wanted to mention? There was, there was just one thing, and it's slightly opportunistic of me, but we are running um, a study at the moment on Cochrane Crowd called the Rapid Study, what's called the Rapid, Rapid, Rapid Study, um, aiming to assess the reliability of single screening search results versus dual screening versus crowded machine screening. And the study's still open for people to take part. I'm sure some of you have already joined it, but um, it would be fantastic if if you wanted to take part, you'd then earn named acknowledgement in the conference publication that we hope to produce and present at the Cochrane Colloquium this year, plus enter a prize draw for um, $100 uh, Amazon voucher, I believe. And um, the way to join it, if you're interested, is to just Google Cochrane Rapid Study and it'll take you to the to the blog where you find details about how to join it and it's going to be live until the 14th of June and essentially what you'd be required to do is just you fill in a very brief questionnaire that then then you get randomized to to an arm in the trial and what you have to do then is screen 100 records and that's that's all you have to do but uh, that would be fantastic if anyone else wanted to join that 
Cochrane uh, Rapid Study. Well, you have three options of things to do when you get off this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. One is to sign into Task Exchange and start looking at the tasks there. Two, we have the screen for me tasks, and then finally the rapid, 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 rapid method study. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everyone for attending. It's been really lovely to have you all here and to have all your questions as well. Um, and just to have, yeah, to have your interest in our platforms is, is just wonderful. So please feel free to um, email us at taskexchange at cochrane.org or crowd at cochrane.org with any further questions. Um, you'll get mm -hmm. the recording emailed to you very soon and we'll also email you with the answer to, to that one question about Cochrane membership. So thanks once yes. again and have a great day everyone. I'll sign out now. Yes. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye.